All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our virtual event, How to Reduce Your College Costs, presented by Gary Sipos of College Cash Solutions. My name is Natasha. I am the Marketing Manager and Virtual Events Coordinator here at Make It Better Media Group, and I will be the woman behind the curtains helping to moderate today's event. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to reach out to me via the chat located on the right side of your screen. We are also joined today by Mimi Toll, Editor-at-Large here at Make It Better Media Group, who will be moderating our Q&A session. Our Q&A portion will be after Gary's presentation. Please enter any questions you may have via the Q&A tab on the right side of your screen. To get to know you a bit better, we have also posted a poll located between the chat and the Q&A tab. We'd love it if you could take the time to let us know how many college-bound students you have. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mimi, who will introduce Gary. Thanks, Yay. Natasha, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name's Mimi, and today you're going to learn the secrets to reducing your college costs. Uh, paying for college is expensive. I know personally I have two girls in college, and the cost of attendances um, can range from $25,000 to $80,000 every year, and a college degree investment is from 100,000 to over 320,000. So I don't know about you, but I didn't have that just laying around. Um, hence, we've got Gary. Gary is a nationally recognized college cost reduction expert. He's appeared on ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox, and has written a book appropriately named College Cash Solutions. Mr. Sipos has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Marin Magazine, Elite Advisor Magazine, and he's been he is being featured in the international best-selling author Brian Tracy's next book, which is called Masters of Success. So he's a master. And he's authored the 15 biggest tax mistakes costing business owners millions. So that is a really good book. I need to get that. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Sipos is an accredited investment fiduciary who specializes in helping families and businesses optimize their financial processes which he tells me there are many, but the one he's gonna talk about today is how to reduce your college costs. So please join me in welcoming Gary Sipos. All right, well, well, well thank you, Mimi. That was a nice introduction. I will, uh, I'm going see, pull up, I, I will pull up my uh, PowerPoint here and uh, let's get going. So this is the secrets to reduce your college costs. And um, here we go. And so this is what we're gonna be discussing today. Uh, what we're going to be discussing is what are college costs? How do you define that? Uh, who's eligible? How to apply? Uh, how you need, you know, how your need-based aid is calculated, and that's the most important line right there. Because once you understand that, then you understand the secrets of how to reduce your college costs if you understand how they calculate it. <clears throat> and the reason why is because some money hits the equations very hard for scholarships and grants, and other monies you could have hits it not at all. And so if you move your money around to the place where it doesn't hit it or minimally hits it or it doesn't hit it at all, then you have a winner. And then, you know, there's different college funding options and just a lot more. So let's let's dive in. So um, first, I thought I would start and show you this because it tells you a little oh, bit Gary, about why. Um, your screen hasn't shared yet. My screen hasn't shared yet. OK, well, good. <laughs> um, let's see. Here. Good to know. Oh, there it is. Got it. Thank you. And um, hit the right button. All right. How, how does that one work? All right. So I thought it would start here. And that is, um, th this tells you a little bit about why I do what I do. <clears throat> and um, I always ask people, what is this? And, and, and of course, it's not a trick question. It's, you know, the answer is it's a car. And, um, but, um, actually, what says this is where I started out in life. Um, I, you know, I came from a very poor family in Phoenix, Arizona. And hence, you can see the saguaro cactus back there. And this is where my dad and I used to live when I was a little kid. So uh, in a car. And afterwards, let me see if I can go to the next screen. There we go. And then this is my life afterwards. And um, pretty amazing. Some of the things I've done in the bottom right hand corner there. There's me at the Nasdaq. I started some um, companies. And one of them got listed on the uh, NASDAQ. So got to go to Wall Street and do the ring the bell thing. So that was fun. Um, I've had multiple startups there, given talks at Harvard and Stanford. And, and, uh, and there's a picture of me with Buzz Aldrin because I designed this helicopter 
for the army. It's called the H64 Apache, and uh, I've done all you know all sorts of just had this crazy great life. You know, starting out from rather meager means. And what was the difference between living in the car with my dad to doing all these fantastic things? And the big linchpin for me was going to college. So, um, but now, unfortunately, college is almost priced out for some people. It's, it's just amazing how expensive it is. And but there's things you can do to reduce college costs, and and I hope you know success for your families too that that I've seen a little bit. And so I'm hopefully showing other parents how to do what I have done. And um, so here's probably the worst slide of the whole uh, deck, and that is. Cost of attendance. Now, cost of attendance is all cost. Um, costs start when you're in, you know, you start school in September and leave in June, and everything in between is under cost of attendance. So that's books, room, board, tuition, travel. Um, you know, all you know, they and they they even put in a couple thousand bucks for you know pizza on the weekends and and haircuts. And so, at Stanford University, as you can see, there is seventy five thousand dollars. Uh, Santa Clara, you're right on its tail, 75, Harvard, 73, and it goes on down, you know, to Cal Poly, one of the best banks for the bucks in the country, 28,000, and then good old College of Marin, you know, 3,000 or even less. And, and, and so this, you know, covers everything. And I've had some, some parents say, wow, 75,000 bucks, is that for all four years? And I'm like, uh, unfortunately, that's only for one year. And yeah. So this is probably the toughest slide to look at. So we'll move on to the next one. So that's cost of attendance. And then this is just saying that there's the inflation rate um, in the United States of America, and then there's the inflation rate up here for uh, college. It's, yeah, and that's probably why all of you are here. And there was um, $181 billion of financial aid that the United States government pushes out towards all these colleges. There's over 3,800 colleges in the United States of America. And, and so um, what, the, what the issue is, is if any of you paid any taxes, and probably all of you, well, um, there's $181 billion of those tax dollars that are coming back in financial aid. So let's see if we can get you some of that tax dollars that you've already paid. And then there's a lot of tax deductions. So for some super um, high wealth people, uh, we go the tax deduction route. And there's over $90 billion of deductions available if you know how to access them. And so those are the things that we'll be speaking about. So here comes lesson number one. And that lesson number one is how many years does it take um, to get a four-year degree? And it's, it's sort of a funny question because like, who's buried in Grant's tomb? Um, but the answer is surprisingly five and a half years. So why does it take five and a half years to get a four year degree. And the number one reason there, you know, many people say, oh, you can't get the money or the classes or, you know, and it's actually changing your major. So the first lesson number one, if you want to reduce your college costs from five and a half years to four years is pick the right major the first time and the right college. And this, these statistics are from uh, Business Week magazine. Yeah, and they say it takes five and a half years to get a four-year degree, and changing your major is number one by far. So let's pick the right major. And so I say, you know, there's a couple things you can do to help pick the right major. One is, you know, pick, um, work intently with your high school counselor, and they can, you know, if you uh, go to an expensive school, you can save over $100,000 if you break it down from five and a half to four years degrees. And, oh, that's, you know, sorry, I went forward a slide. And, and then there's other tools you can do. And, and there's one I have from uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, an online tool. And essentially, the student engages with those tools and, and they've had remarkable success across the country, the kids that follow through on this tool. And essentially what happened was um, it, encourages, it encourages them, it does a lot of interviewing and encourages them to go on um, informational interviews and then and then do all sorts of internships. And it's, just, it's, a, it's a great process. And essentially you try to figure out you know, what you wanna do after college, before college, which is quite a, quite a trick. And, but the kids that went through this MIT process, um, they um, graduated in 4.2 years versus five and a half. And so I'd recommend to use as many tools as possible to identify the right college 
and the right major. So that's number one. All right, number two. And number two is called Western, how to reduce your college costs. And that's called the Western Undergrad Exchange, Witchy Wooey. I love those words, Witchy Wooey. <laughs> Try to say that five times fast. And Witchy Wooey essentially is a program. And it's just Western United States schools. And if you're going to a public school out of state, not all public schools out of state participate in this program, but the schools that do, they cap out the max they can charge for out of state um, tuition. So, and it's maxed at, I believe, 150 cent. Yeah, 150%. And there it is. So, the most they can charge is 150% of in state tuition. And many public out of state schools will charge out of state students 200, 250, 300% of the in state tuition. So, this caps it. So, that, that helps you out. So, if you um, are thinking of going to an out of state, a public out of state school, then I would look to, to this website to see if that school participates in Witchy Wooey. And then one thing you have to know is you have to check a box on the admission application that says, I, I would like to be admitted to this public school out of state, and I would like the Wooey rate. <laughs> Wooey rate, it's difficult to say, Western Undergrad Exchange rate. So there it is. All right, next, uh, lesson number three, SAT versus ACT. Now, in the past, in fact, when I um, applied to colleges, I remember I applied to one of the schools was the University of um, Chicago and, uh, and then a bunch of West Coast schools. And the West Coast schools, they all took the SAT and the Midwest schools, they took the ACT. And so I had to take both, unfortunately, um, because I remember University of Chicago was like, except, you know, submit your ACT scores and we don't know what an SAT is. And then the West Coast schools had the same statement, but the other way around. But now it's no longer true. Every college in the United States, remember, all 3,800 will take the SAT or the ACT. And then some, you know, are saying you don't have to submit them all. So that's even better um, in a sense. But the reason why I'm talking about it is most parents believe the SAT and ACT is only for admissions. And actually it's used by the financial aid department in addition. And now that COVID is starting to People are getting inoculated. I'm sure they're going to reinstate the SAT and ACT because last year they sort of waived it a bit. And um, but this year, kids are going to have to take it again. And the financial aid office, they use the SAT and ACT scores to give out scholarships and grants. So um, that's one thing to, to know well. And so what I say is if you want to maximize your scholarships and grants, if you're going to get money from the financial aid system, then you want to pick one test or the other. So you want to pick the SAT or the ACT and not both because you're essentially you're just draining your energy. And because, you know, each test, they're monumental. So then how do you figure out? Yeah, so there it is. I say, focus your efforts on one and forget the other, not both. Because I believe both, if you take both, that's uh, unconstitutional and under the clause of cruel and unusual punishment. Because boy, it is, it was pretty cruel and unusual punishment when I had to take both. And thank you that the, the rules finally changed. Um, and so the higher you, the score you get on your ACT or your SAT, the more free money you get, the more scholarships and grants you get. So that's why I'm focused on because I'm all about the money. And when it comes to admissions, I, that's really not my area of expertise. But when it comes to reducing money, that, that is, that's my area. So then the question becomes, how do you figure out you know, which test your brain is? Or is your brain more naturally tuned towards the ACT or the SAT? And there's various tests you can do. If you go to Kaplan, I know there's one there, captest.com, um, or my name's Gary Sipos. Um, if you, at the end of this presentation, I'll um, give you uh, an, uh, an invite to come see me, you know, online or face-to-face -face in my office. And to find out if I can help you reduce your college costs specifically. And then one of the things I have access to is a comparison test that your student would take online. And at the end of the test, it would tell you whether, you know, your brain is a little bit more attuned towards the ACT or SAT, and then you would know which test to focus on and which one to forget about and not study for and put all your energy into the one test. All right, so that's that. So lesson number three is the SAT, ACT can put money in your pocket. All right, next one. Oh yeah, this is the equation. If you're gonna remember one thing from this whole presentation, this is the equation you need to know. 
And the equation is COA minus EFC equals award. All right, so that's totally uh, self-explanatory. We'll move on to the next slide. Just kidding. That was my big joke of the day. All right, so cost of attendance, or COA means cost of attendance. And that was that one slide I showed you at the very beginning that said Stanford was 75,000 and Harvard was 72 or whatever. Um, so cost of attendance is tuition, books, room and board. It's all your costs. You, know, you leave in September, come back in June, travel, everything, you know, going to pizza on the weekends, they give you a couple thousand bucks for that. They give you credit for that. And that's all cost of attendance. All right, then there's still so cost of attendance minus EFC. So EFC stands for expected family contributions, what the government expects your family to contribute to college. And the EFC formula is nonlinear, nonsensical, <laughs> and, but it's based on all these different things. It's based on your how old are the parents, how old are the students, how many students you have, um, how many students are in college at the same time, um, how much money you have, but more importantly, where is it at? Because money over here hits the EFC formula really hard. Money over here doesn't hit it at all. Money over here hits it just slightly. And so it matters, you know, where you have your money and how it's formatted and maybe your assets too, like you can have rental properties. And, but if they're structured this way, it hits it hard. It's structured this way, it doesn't hit it at all. And the EFC formula, it was created by Congress. And so anything created by Congress is convoluted and a lot of times nonsensical. And, and this equation fits that bill. And so, but once you know your EFC, you take the cost of attendance, you minus your EFC, and that's your financial aid award. So it's a pretty simple equation once you know those two numbers. And so there you go. And where does all this money come from? You know, it comes from federal taxes, state taxes, um, colleges and universities have their own private endowments. And yeah, and that, that's where to get the money. And then there's private sources, and that's not in the financial aid system. That would be like um, taking, um, you know, applying for an application with the Kiwanis or Rotary Club or, or some, yeah, some other place where you might get a scholarship and grant. And I say, are those private scholarships worth it? And in most times, I'm not quite convinced. I would put more of my energy into studying for the SAT and ACT because that'll put money in your pocket. Um, the private scholarships, you know, it's, you know, fishing for different scholarships out there, not in the financial aid system, um, is pretty hit or miss. And in fact, it's only 2% of all the aid issued. And so, for example, there's one website called fastweb.com I put there. And that's a place where you can fish for, you know, external scholarships. And I just say, if you, you know, spend your time doing that, I'd probably spend more of my time doing ACT prep or SAT prep, whichever prep is better for your brain, or your student's brain. All right, so how do you apply for aid? It's called the FAFSA, Free Application for Federal Student Aid. That's a mouthful. And the FAFSA is, you know, for whatever school, all 3,800 schools will take the FAFSA. And, you know, so everybody has to fill it out and you fill it out each year because, you know, your income and your assets will change as, you know, each year your student's in college. And, it, you know, one thing to just know if it's done wrong or inconsistently with other forms that they'll need to fill out, it'll get bumped and it takes four to six weeks to process and money will flow through your hands and you don't even know it. And so you want to fill it out right the first time. So that's one thing to know. And then here comes a little bit of an odd, funny statement. And a lot of times you'll... If you use common sense, you know, this is a great statement. If you use common sense and sound logic answering the questions, you'll probably get it wrong because um, you have to read the detail. There's like 30,000 pages of government docs or, you know, behind this. And if you read those documents, um, then you'll know how you sh really should answer the questions. And But if you just use common sense, you'll probably feel it wrong because it's a government form. There you go. All right. So when can you apply? What's the very first date? And the very first date that you can submit your FAFSA is on October 1st of your student's senior year in high school. And you want to, um, yeah, right here's a, you, you want to fill it out. I'll just say, you know, you don't have to wait up until, you know, the end of September, um, you know, to midnight and then on top, October 1st, you fill it out very quickly. But you do want to be, you know, they do issue the awards first come, first serve. 
And so if you get it done within the month of October or maybe the first two weeks of uh, you know, November, um, you'll be first in line. But you don't want to wait until February or March or April of the next year. Yeah. And uh, this is from the Wall Street Journal. And it said schools award money on first come first serve basis. If you wait until April or May, you'll be very far back in line. And, and the financial aid officers have buckets of money. And as soon as they get these financial aid, you know, they get the FAFSA, they start doling out this money. And, you know, and so initially there's lots of money in the buckets, but when the buckets get low, they become a little bit more stingy uh, giving out awards. So that's why. All right. Um, so how do you apply? So we spoke about the FAFSA and that's an online form and it's free application for federal student aid. But then some schools also ask for a second form called the CSS profile. And this is mainly private schools. Not, not all private schools want the CSS profile in addition to the FAFSA, but some private schools do, or a lot of them do, about you know, a couple hundred of them do. And so you, you'll fill out the FAFSA and the CSS profile school, and then you'll do that every year, of course. And so many private schools want this. And they'll ask uh, some additional questions beyond the FAFSA, like home equity, and, and they'll have a more detailed explanation of income and assets. And here's the big one. It's got to be consistent with the FAFSA. So if there's contradictions between the FAFSA form and the CSS profile, they'll get bounced. And like I said, money will flow through your fingers and you won't even know it because, you know, those buckets are getting lower and they're getting more stingy as the months roll on. And so you want to fill them out consistently. And, and then lastly, oh, there it is. I wrote it on that bullet there. <laughs> Using common sense is a mistake because uh, you'll, the way they wrote the questions, some, you know, most of them are obvious, you know, like what's your first name? What's your last name? What's your address? That's pretty obvious. But there's other questions on there that are a little bit, interpretive and if you use common sense a lot of times you'll just you'll answer incorrectly let's put it that way or not to your advantage that, that's probably the best way to say it and then there's also some more forms some schools have their own institutional forms and they'll ask you to you know fill those out in addition to the facts on the CSS profile and essentially just be consistent all right and let's see here all right and then again yeah don't use common sense <laughs> yeah, fill them out to your advantage all right, and then also there could be some additional forms, and some additional forms or business supplements if you're if your own business owner. And in fact, that's how I got started focusing on college cost reduction. My, my, much less I did it for myself. And then also there's a divorce scenario. So we'll go through these two scenarios very quickly. Um, so if you have your own business, this is you know like I said how I got started in in focusing directly on college cost reduction that financial process. And if you, there's ways to exempt your business. And so, you know, you, what, one thing they'll ask on the forums is, hey, you know, do you have a small business? You write yes. And then they'll ask you the, the tough question. And that is, and this is the landline question. And they'll say, how much is it worth? Well, if you talk to your CPA, you'll say, all right, your, your business is worth this much. And then you'll probably won't get a penny for college. Um, but there's ways to make sure that your, your, business is exempt. And if you do that, well then, great. Um, then you put down zero, you know, because I, I've exempted my business. And so that's one thing to know is it is possible to exempt your business assets from the EFC calculation. calculation. And let's see here. Um, we'll talk really quickly about financial aid and the officers. And this is a quote I got from the New York Times. And the New York Times said, parents and students sometimes forget that we work for the school, not for them. And so just know that they're very nice people, the financial aid officers. And but, you know, it's sort of analogous to going to the IRS for, you know, preparing your tax returns. Um, they'll help you fill it out, but they probably won't help you get every deduction as possible. And that's why you, you hire a, an attorney or a CPA. All right, so let's go over a divorce couple case. And um, this is another scenario uh, that gets confused all the time. So we have a husband and a wife, and or pardon me, a man and a woman, and they get married, yay. And then they have a daughter, um, so yay, so that's nice. But unfortunately, later on, they get divorced. So dad lives over here, and mom and the daughter lives in another location. And they share custody 51-49, so um, yeah. 
and mom has the daughter 51% of the time and dad has a 49. So almost 50, 50, but just one more day with mom. Okay. And then, but dad, during the divorce decree, dad said, you know, I want to take my daughter as the tax deduction on my tax return. So mom was fine with that. So dad takes a deduction of 1040. And the divorce decree also said that dad's going to pay for 100% of college costs. So then they negotiated that. And then also there's a bunch of 529s, which are these college savings plans, which I'm not a big fan of. Like they work against you in the financial aid form list. But dad owns all the 529s. And then mom remarries a new guy, but the new guy has a prenup. And it says that you know, the new guy won't pay for any college costs. But that's okay because the divorce decree says you know, biological dad's going to pay for college costs. So then the question becomes, it's now time to fill out the FAFSA and the CSS profile and, and maybe the institutional forms and all these different forms, you know, whose financial aid information goes on it? You know, does it, does the dad, cause you know, he takes the tax deduction, his daughter's listed on the tax return or, um, you know, or maybe it's the new, new father, but then, you know, he has that prenup and, um, or is it mom or, you know, wh whose information or is it everybody's the new guy, you know, the biological dad, who knows? And I've seen all sorts of combinations. It's, it's hilarious on this one. And, and actually the answer is um, all the other stuff is a red herring, all those other bullets, except for the very top, well, the top two bullets, and which are saying sort of the same thing. And that is if the student, so in this case, the daughter lives with mom one more day a year, then you're gonna put down the mom's information only. And actually um, the dad financially doesn't exist. So mom is called the custodial parent. And then, but mom did get remarried. And even though there is a prenup that says the new husband is not going to pay a penny of college costs, um, they'll ask for the new husband's and the mom's um, financial information yeah, to calculate the EFC and all that. So that's how you would fill out the FAFSA. And if mom didn't get remarried, then it would just be mom's information. All right, so I see that one get messed up all the time, so that's why I thought I'd go through that scenario. And, and then what do I do? And so I'm a financial advisor, but I focus on this bottom area here, and the bottom area is called unknown and unnecessary wealth transfer. So I do financial processes. Now, most advisors are up in the blue area, and essentially they say how much money you have and what rate of return you're getting. And whatever you say, how much you're getting, they'll add 1% to it and say, well, come to me, you're only getting six, I get you seven. And that can be very useful. But I look at, you know, I'll look at that, but I'll look at other things first. And, and so I call this your circle of wealth and the goal is to get your circle as big as possible over your lifetime. And so I'll look at your lifestyle because let's just say you're earning 300,000 a year, but you're spending 400,000. Well, then your circle of wealth will contract, of course. And so you need to get that under control. And then, you know, and then of course you want to get your investments, but the, but the, that third area there is where I focus on first actually, and it's called unknown and then necessarily wealth transfers. And there's a whole bunch of them. Um, so for example, like converting an IRA to a Roth, well, there's ways to do it without paying the conversion tax or highly reducing the conversion tax. If you had a million dollars in an IRA and you converted that to a Roth, well, then you would lose essentially in California 50% or 500,000. So you'd have 500,000 in a Roth and there could be an argument that that's a really smart thing to do just like that, brute force. But there's a, a other more elegant financial process ways to transfer that million bucks. So instead of having a million bucks in an IRA that will be taxed in the future, at whatever tax rates are in the future, now you'll have $950,000 in a Roth, which will grow tax free and come, and come out tax free. There's ways to do that. There's financial processes to do that. Or there's ways to eliminate capital gains. That's a financial process. And there's ways to reduce college costs. That's a financial process. So this third area is financial processes. And, and that's what I do and that makes me unique and different. So let's call my circle of wealth. All right. So we'll move on. And and so yeah, so we're focusing on the college cost reduction financial process for this. Okay. So let's see. So what schools are giving you the best shot at money? One thing you'll need to know if you remember that equation, cost of attendance minus EFC equals award. So some schools, whatever that number is, they'll give you 100 percent of the award. Like for example, Stanford, yay, go Stanford. Um, they'll give you 100% of whatever that equation says. 
but other schools might give you less. So I'll pick on Berkeley. <laughs> and so Berkeley gives you 82% of what that equation states. So if you're, you know, that equation says you're supposed to get, you know, $100,000, well, well, I, I, I don't know. I was going to do that easy for the math. Let's say ten thousand dollars. There you go. Um, so then Berkeley would give you eight thousand two hundred, where Stanford would give you, you know, ten thousand. So um, it's good to know which schools would, you know, gives which awards. And some schools give you zero. They're like, okay, great, I love that equation, but we're going to not give you anything. So it's good to know um, before applying to schools which schools are generous and which ones schools are not. So that way you would know how much you're going to pay. And yeah, so very, you know, yeah. And so even before you go apply, so many schools, I'll pick on a couple. Let's see. Um, you know, yeah, there's a school I call UC, University of California at Eugene. UC Eugene. I, I've heard that school. Yeah. Other people call it University of Oregon, but I call it UC Eugene because so many Californians go up there. And unfortunately, they're very not generous to California students. So their percentage of need met, uh, you know, award met is low. Um, another one is uh, Colorado at Boulder. That's another one. If you live in Colorado and attend Boulder, a very generous school. But if you have CA next to your school, California, not so generous. All right. So it's good to know before you go there, because if you go visit um, UC Eugene or University of Oregon or visit Boulder, you know, your students are going to fall in love with it. And then it's like, oh, no, they're, you know, we're, we're going to get a very low package. All right. So one thing to pay attention to. Is percentage of award met. And the next thing is percentage of gift aid. So this is, so you have your total award. Your total award will consist, consist of gift aid and um, loans and work study. And so, and gift aid is scholarships and grants or free money you don't have to pay back. So you would like schools that give high award met and high gift aid. It's that way, you know, you can get free money. And then self help is student loans and work study. And some schools will give you a high award met, but it's all in student loans and work study. And so that's not the greatest. And work study is a job on campus. And of course, student loans are loans for the student. So I say know those percentages before you apply. And the bad news is if you go to websites, you know, if you go to all the different college websites, it's really hard to find this information. Well, you hardly, good luck, you'll spend hours and hours trying to find it on the websites. Um, but where to find this information, is, you know, there's three big places, Princeton Review or Big Future will have it. Or if you come to me at the end, I'll invite you to meet with me to dial in your specific EFC and see if there's any techniques we can do to reduce your college costs or shield your real estate or whatever, or businesses. Um, I can do that very quickly and figure out um, if I can help you out. And then also I know all the percentages for all the schools. So I can, you know, if you're interested in a couple of schools, I can tell you those. Um, different percentages those schools give, whether they're generous or not. All right, so we'll do a quick, quick case study just to drill this point home. And so we got two schools. We got school A and B. School A is fifty thousand dollars, the expensive school, and school B is the cheaper school. It's only thirty thousand bucks. And your EFC, your expected family contribution, is the same at every school. So in this case, it's ten thousand. So at every school you, you apply to, your EFC is 10,000, what the government expects your family to contribute. So your reward package would be 50 minus 10 equals 40,000 at school A, and your in school B, your reward package would be $20,000. So here's the big question. The question is, and it's a trick question, how much you know would each school, would it cost the parents? You know, How much are the parents gonna shell out of their checking account to have your student attend school A or school B? And the answer to that question is, I don't know, because right now we don't have enough information yet. So the next piece of information we need to know is how much, how generous is each school? So school A is very generous. They give 100% of, of the award. And but school B is not quite as much. They only give 60%. So instead of getting a $20,000 award, they'll give you a $12,000 award. So they short you about 8,000 bucks. So how much would the parent pay at each school? Well, uh, at school A, you would pay the EFC or the expected family contribution, which is $10,000. And at school B, you would pay $18,000, you know, the 8,000 they shorted you. And so you'd pay your EFC the 10,000 plus the 8,000 unmet award. And so, it, you know, it almost costs you twice as much to go to the quote unquote cheaper school. So you don't wanna be necessarily 
um, gun shy of the sticker price. What you want to know is how much you will pay. There you go. All right. So, and when it comes to you fill out the fast one, the CSS profile, you'll get you know an award package. So that's great. Now you know you used to get letters, but now it's um, a lot of times you'll get it just online these days on high tech. But some schools they'll misaward you. But you know they won't give you. So for example, uh, Berkeley is eighty three eighty five. So they won't give you eighty three percent of award net and and, and eighty five in gift aid. You know, let's just say they give you a little bit less. You know, they give you a seventy two percent award net award, and if they, you know, so they misawarded you. So if you know their percentages, you can catch them on it and then go back and negotiate. And, and then sometimes you can try to compete with other schools. That's um, that's a tactic. But um, I find if you just know their percentages and negotiate with them on their percentages, that gives the best results. So if you get underawarded or misawarded, you know, you say, hey, here's the percentages that you should have met. And here's what you gave me, the percentages you gave me. If you call them up and just say, hey, you know, uh, thank you for the $20,000 award package, um, but I would like 30, they just laugh and hang up the phone. But if you say, hey, you, um, you know, your average is 82%, you gave me a 73, uh, I'm just looking for a fair award, you know, would you please just give me your average award? They're much more responsive to that type of negotiation. All right, so, you know, having, knowing what they give, on a historical average, you can negotiate your package much better. You know, and, and then of course, if they come back with my clients, if I get an award letter from one of my client's students and they met their percentages, then I tell my client, all right, you got a fair award. But of course, if they didn't, then we go to bat. And uh, there you go. So can you negotiate with financial aid officers? Absolutely. Um, but you just have to know, you have to speak their vocabulary and you have to use their percentages against them, and that'll work. Um, if you just call them up and say, "Hey, can I have an extra three or five or ten thousand bucks?" They, they they get that call every day, and they just laugh and hang up the phone. All right. And then there's three types of people according to the Department of Education, and there's lower income and assets um, folks, and maybe you know you just rent and you don't have much savings, and these people just fill out the forms. You'll do really well. Um, then there's the middle class, and maybe you own a home, you have some 529 plans, you know, possibly even an UTMA, maybe you run on property, you, know, you could even own your own business, uh, grandparents could help out with all these things. These are the people that I can really hit home with and or hit a grand slam and help you reduce your college costs because there's a lot of landmines here. There's rental property landmines that we need to shield. Um, grandparents' money hits that financial aid formula really hard. Um, so that'll blow out you know, your ability to get any scholarships or grants. Uh, 529s work against you in the financial aid formulas, which is unfortunate because there's other ways to save for college where you know, the, the money doesn't, you can have you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars in certain accounts, it doesn't hit your EFC format at all. So you maximize your scholarships and grants to you. Um, there's wills to shield your business, ways to shield your home. So there's lots of techniques that we can apply to the middle class. And, and so these are the people that really need to see me. You know? So lower income and assets, you don't need to see me. Just fill out the form, you'll do well. Uh, middle class, you, know, you need my help. All right. And then there's a super wealthy and, with, and with, you know, people that are you know, top, way top one percenters. Um, there's advanced tax strategies. There's a lot of tax strategies that I find CPAs don't fully utilize. And so I work with your CPA and say, hey, you know, what about this concept? What about this concept? Can we use this, this, and this? And then we run the numbers, and uh, and usually we come out with a pretty healthy way of you know paying for college with tax-free money. All right. So here's a couple of ideas of how to lower your EFC so you maximize your scholarships and grants. And so national index multiplier. So there's this thing called the national index multiplier, and this is for um, your home or even rental properties too. And if you use this national index multiplier to appraise your house, um, one of the questions they'll ask you on the forums is, do you own a home? So yes, that's a pretty easy question. And then they'll say, do you have a mortgage? Yes, and they'll say, what's the value of your mortgage? So that's easy, you look it up, all right, I have a $400,000 mortgage. And then comes the trick question. And like I said, you know, there's questions that you use common sense and sound logic, you'll blow it, here's one of them. And the trick question is, how much is your home worth? 
So one thing you could do is, you know, talk to a real estate agent or go to Zillow and say, how much is my home worth? And so around here in the Bay Area, you know, one and a half, two million, three million dollar homes. And if you do that, you just step on the landline and, you know, you probably won't get a bunch or you highly reduce your ability to get scholarships and grants. But if you but if you use the national index multiplier to appraise your house, which there's only two methodologies that are legal, you can use the fair market value, you know, that's Zillow, a real estate agent of your house, or you can use the natural index multiplier. And the national index multiplier will appraise your house in the Bay Area much less than your house um, is actually worth. And those are both legal methodologies per the Department of Education code. So I tend to use the national index multiplier a lot, especially in the San Francisco Bay Area. And that's one way to lower, lower your EFC. And then if you place a rental in a special type of LLC, um, you can shield your rental real estate, but you have to do that well because, you know, when you fill out the LLC boxes, there's lots of forms, there's lots of boxes and you got to get, get them all lined up in the right spot. But if you do that well, you can shield your rental, rental real estate. So that's nice. That's a way to lower your EFC. Otherwise, they'll look at your rental properties and they'll say, great, sell your rental property and send us the money. Um, yeah. All right. Um, 529 plans, unfortunately, they work against you. So what's really nice about 529s is, is you get tax-free growth and tax-free distribution for college. So that's good. Um, the bad news is one of the questions on the forms is, do you have a 529 plan? Yes. And then how much is it? And then that money works against you in the financial aid formulas. And there's other ways, more effective financial vehicles you can put money in that will grow tax-free and come out to tax-free just like a 529. But um, it doesn't count against you in the financial aid formulas. And I tend to like saving money in those types of plans. And then the worst thing is a 529 owned by a grandparent because you don't list the 529 on your forms, but when the grandparent pays money to the college, they whack you pretty intently at a 50% rate. Um, so if your grandparent you know, put in $20,000 towards college out of 529, they'll take $10,000 the next year away from you in scholarships and grants. So yeah, not a good strategy. All right. And here's a good one. Uh, if there's money in a child's name, so you have an UPMA or even a savings account in the child's name, they're going to ask that, you know, how much money is in the child? Remember I said, how much money do you have and where is it at? It's more important where it's at. And money in a kid's name hits the financial aid form as 400% harder than at that same amount of money in the parent's name. So just transferring the money from the kid to the parent will help reduce by 400% and then transferring it to other accounts can help it infinitely in other words that is zero percent and uh, shifting money from the parents to the students um, income shifting this is a tax technique you know to fund a Roth um, that's a really good way that in fact yeah here, here's a way I said there's other accounts you can fund that money grows tax-free comes out tax-free and um, also is exempt so a Roth so and then this one so what you do is if you have your own company you hire your child you fund a Roth for your child through their income because you've only filed, you know, fund a Roth with income you earn. So your child through their income funds a Roth, money grows in a Roth at their tax rate, their tax rate is typically zero. So the money goes in tax-free, then it grows tax-free because um, a Roth by definition, money grows tax-free. And then you can take money out of a Roth to fund college. So you pull the money out talk, uh, you know, tax-free and the Roth asset is exempted from the financial aid formulas. So I call that the Gary 529 plan is doing that Roth strategy. And therefore that money in the Roth doesn't hit you, hit, hit the financial aid formulas, it's exempt. And the money goes in tax-free, as opposed to 529, you have to put in after-tax money. And then it grows tax-free and comes out tax-free for college. So there you go, a, a much better idea than a 529. All right. Um, and there's many, many more, depending on everybody's personal situation. Um, all right. So when to start? Um, that lady there is supposed to be pregnant. And um, so I, I say the best time to start is, you know, even before you have kids. Because um, then we don't have to unwind anything. But, you know, when's the best time to plant a tree 20 years ago? When's the second best time? This is an old uh, South African saying. And the second best time to plant a tree is today. You know, let's start now. And yeah, and then another thing too is the fast one, the CSS profile, they ask for your tax returns and, and um, 
And so it's two years prior. So two years from when your student enrolls. So if your student enrolls in college in September, of, let's just say 2021, then 2019, the last year of 19 returns. So it's sort of so they ask for your assets at that moment, but they look at your income two years before. It's sort of crazy, but that's how they do it. And so the sooner we set you on the right path, there's no unwinding of 529 plans or resetting past plans. Um, yeah. And, and so the sooner the better. That, that's the moral story there. All right. And some myths and realities. One is people I get asked all the time, hey, you know, my income's up here. You know, is it too high? And, and the answer is there's no limit per se. Um, it, you know, it depends on all sorts of facts and circumstances. So, for example, I have a buddy, um, yeah, he's a Stanford MBA, and he earns over a million dollars a year. So he is, he's got high, high income, you could say. And But I, by using certain techniques, I was able to get him scholarships and grants. So, um, you know, we through all sorts of other techniques, we were able to get him to do that. Um, grades too low. They don't look at your grades when they're issuing financial aid awards. If you get in, um, you know, the grades, you know, if you get accepted, um, the one thing they do look at is SAT and ACT scores. So but the grades, you know, people say, oh, my student's grades too low. I'm not going to get any scholarships grants. They don't look at grades. Um, own a home or rental property and say, hey, I'm in the Bay Area. I got this home. I have these rental properties. Well, there's ways to shield that. Um, special aid, you know, uh, financial aid goes to special groups. That's not true. Um, it's easy and intuitive. This is really off. This is <laughs> not true at all. There's all sorts of hidden landmines in the forms. And I'll show you where those are. And so what I do is I give my uh, clients answer sheets, and I'll say answer the FAFSA this way, answer the CSS profile this way. And some of the, you know, most of the answers will be obvious, but some of them um, are a little bit odd. And that's because I'm answering the questions per the department, the Department of Education codes, as opposed to just how the form says it, because the form will say it ambiguously, and and they know that most parents will answer this way, where you could answer another way. And it's a fair process. I don't think it's quite fair at all. And college financial aid officers will help. They're nice people, but they work for the school. All right, so here's the big summary here and the big finish. So know which colleges provide the most aid before applying. So watch out for UC Eugene. Um, there are billions of dollars available through government and college grants. So just know there's billions available and let's get some of those billions back to you and consider which schools if you're thinking of going public out of state. Your high school counselor can put $100,000 of cash in your pocket or, or more importantly, that is, you know, pick the right college and pick the right major the first time. Because once you start changing majors and changing colleges and then you get more on the five and a half year track, well, you're just paying more and more for college. So let's get your student the right um, college and major the first time. And the facts on the CSS Pro forms, they need to be error free and consistent and don't use common sense. <laughs> like for example, that one, that one statement was, um, how much is your house worth? Well, commonsensically, you know, you go to Zillow and there it is. But um, you can use the, the Federal Housing Index Multiplier, which actually has no common sense to it at all, but it'll appraise your house at a certain rate and you can use that rate. All right, um, federal, let's see, financial aid is given out in first come first serve. So, you know, you wanna be near the beginning. You don't have to be on the very first day, but you wanna be in the first month or two. Um, when financial aid is being given out. So get your forms done sooner than later. Because, and then once you know, the aid's gone, it's gone. And then just like buying a car, you can negotiate, but you just have to know their vocabulary and know their percentages, and, and then you can get a fair award. Make sure you get a fair award. And yeah, financial aid officers work for the schools. Education codes, um, yeah, the education codes, there's the tax code, and as you know, the tax code is very complicated. That's why we have CPAs and tax attorneys and everything else. And the educational codes, I hate to say, are just as complicated. Um, and if you read the education codes, and then you'll really know how to fill out the forms in your best interest. I've read through the forms, yeah, lovely doing that, but I've read through it and, and um, I know now how to fill out those forms in your best interest. And there's just lots of tools. So just know there's lots of tools available to help you reshape your college costs. And yeah, and then beware of the two-year rule, they look at your income two years back. And so therefore, it's the advantages to start your tax planning for college now. And I remember I had a, a lady come in and she was 
pretty darn close to nine months pregnant with twins. And her mother came in. So grandma came in and, you know, mom came in. And then there was the two kids not quite born yet. And we worked on their financial. And the first thing grandma said is, I'm going to set up two 529 plans for my, you know, two um, soon to be born children, their grandchildren. And um, so we educated grandma and, and now she's on a much better track. All right. So now that we finished this general meeting, um, I'm going to invite you to a one hour exploratory meeting. And essentially um, I'm going to waive the initial fee. And since you've been to this workshop and during this workshop, I, I mean, during our complimentary meeting, what we'll do is I'll ask you a whole bunch of questions. And my goal is to see, can I help you reduce your college costs or not? And after the at the end of the meeting, I'll tell you whether I can help you or not. And if I cannot help you reduce your college costs, I'll let you know. But if I can, I'll let you know that too. And, and then of course, you know, hopefully we both, we hope I can, and typically I can, and uh, then we'll go from there. And so um, if you would like to set up a meeting with me, you can go to collegecashsolutions.com. And so www.collegecashsolutions.com. And then there's a book a meeting button and you click on that. And then you can schedule an initial meeting and we can either meet in my office in San Rafael or via Zoom. And of course, these days, most, most families are meeting via Zoom. And although I'm getting my first injection uh, tomorrow, so there you go. Um, yeah, and here's an old um, this, yeah, shot of my website, but I'm in San Rafael, California. And, um, and there's my phone number if you ever need to give me a call. And so there you are, finish. And so now we'll, we'll take questions. And uh, uh, you know, any questions that anybody has on helping you reduce your college costs. Okay, okay. I'm back. Um, thank you so much, Gary. And you couldn't say it better that the FAFSA. Oh, is there something wrong? Oh, oh. That the FAFSA that you do, you cannot use common sense, and that was <laughs> I. It made me crazy. It was so hard to figure out. So um, I'm going to start with some questions that we have here um, from Anonymous. If my, student, if my student is heading to college in the fall and we've already filled out the FAFSA form, is it too late to unwind? And would we be able to save money starting with the second year? Right. So the, the second part of that question, absolutely. So if we you know, rearranged your finances and got them in the right place, um, definitely the second year, you know, you, you'll, because you have to fill out the fast for each year. And each year, it sort of like starts over again, per se. Oh, and I think it's, I just chimed but, in and asked, oh, can but, they revive the, the FAFSA? Sorry, I asked it incorrectly. Can they revive right. it? Yeah. yeah. But but when it comes, so that was the second part of the answer. And then the first part about the FAFSA, yeah, you can re-log in to the FAFSA and fix it. Um, but then you, uh, then you, so once you fix it online, then you have to punch the school again or contact the school and say, hey, I updated my FAFSA. There was a couple of mistakes. Um, you know, can you reissue an award based on my new EFC number? So, we, so yes, you can do that. Yeah. And I'll also second the fact that the people in the financial aid offices are really friendly. They usually are helpful. Yeah. You, know, so you just tap them back. Yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. Now, does the FAFSA apply to graduate school? Um, yeah. So here, here, when it comes to graduate school, um, you they will ask you to fill out a FAFSA. And then the nice thing about that is once you graduate from college, you're now considered an independent school student. You know, it doesn't matter how old you are. If you have a college degree, you're independent, which means you, you can leave your parents' financial information off the FAFSA. So you just put the students, you know, uh, in income and assets. That's the good news. Now, here's the bad news. The bad news is graduate school, there's no standards. So for undergraduate, there's standards like, you know, this school gives 82%. And, and so you can write an appeal letter that says, hey, you know, you're supposed to give me 82% of award and 85% and in need met and our scholarships and grants. And you can negotiate with a financial aid officer using their, you know, these standards and these rules. When it comes to graduate school, there's no rules. So that if you you fill out the FAFSA and if you do get money, it's essentially it's almost like a popularity con uh, contest. You just, you know, you need somebody 
um, a professor on your side saying, yeah, you know, throw this student a bone and give him some money. So unfortunately, there's you really can't negotiate for graduate school. But it's have you worked with many people doing the graduate school or? Yes. Um, yes. But like I said, when it comes to undergrad, I can negotiate because I can use those those numbers and we can you know, say, look, you know, according to the Department of Education codes, you know, you're supposed to give us a fair award. Here's your definition, you know, whatever the school it is, and they mm -hmm. all have different numbers, you know, here's your numbers. And and then, you know, and here's the numbers you gave us that they're, they're way off. You know, look, we're just looking for a fair award. You can say that for undergrad. When it comes to graduate school, you know, essentially there's no standards. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's a lot more difficult negotiation. But yeah, but I do, to get, you know, we do do our best to negotiate for grad school too. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Well, the other questions are popping in here. So nice. I like this one. What are the primary ways to reduce costs at the UCs? Um, you know, our, our state. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, so that, it depends. And, um, you know, there was a bunch of area, you know, areas I talked into, you know, like reducing, when they ask you the question of how much you're, um, uh, or like shifting money from a student to the parent or putting your the parent's assets into shielded accounts, or if the grandparent has money, um, make sure you, you know, it gets paid to the school in a way where it doesn't look like it's coming from the grandparent because grandparents' money hits the, the formulas very hard. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of techniques and almost to answer that question, I would need to have you come to my office. Like I'm asking it's you. Very individual. I I, I can. Yeah, very. That. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and and then I would ask you all sorts of questions, and then I would see which techniques work for you, or I would tell you, you know what, you know, just the way you're you're positioned, um, there's no techniques that will help you, and you know, well, here's how much cost will cost you, or college will cost you. Yeah. Okay. So here's, here's another really great one. Um, if the family has a high income, but the student has a top 1% SAT score, is it realistic to assume that the scholarship or any grant money will um, be awarded or the high income short circuit the merit award? Right. Um, well, there was an example I gave a little bit earlier of my uh, friend from the Stanford MBA school, one of my clients, and where he makes over a million bucks a year and he gets you know, need-based aid, scholarships and grants. Now, his situation, we really had to configure him a lot but once we, you know, you know, configured him in the right way, um, he was able to get it. So high income is only one factor of many that one needs to consider. So just having an high income alone won't take you out. There's also all sorts of other factors we need to um, take into consideration. Yeah, okay. there you go. Um, and this this is a good one. This is probably because well, they yeah, so asked. I'm. I'm I'm not going to fill in the blanks. I've heard yeah. that grandparent 529 should be done starting in the junior year of college. Is that correct? I just don't know how you could hide it in the first couple of years. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah, that, that's a that's a great strategy. And actually, the person that asked that question, you know, um, way to go. You, you, you <laughs> nailed the way to do a grandparent one. If you can hold off from, you know, after you fill out your last FAFSA, which would be in October of the student's junior year, so you know halfway through the junior year, um, is when you'll fill out the last FAFSA. And then after you fill out that FAFSA, then you can start paying using the grandparent 529. That's if your student graduates in four years. So essentially in the very last year of your college, the grandparent can pay money to the school out of their 529 plan. And then because it affects the year after. And if there's no year after, then the grandparent money will not negatively affect any awards. And so, yeah, there you go. So that person, yeah, so so good job. So, you know, especially in November or December of the student's junior year, you can finally start paying money um, towards college from a grandparent 529. You know. And then do you really do you Stick, do you just stay with the family for the four years or is it like a consultation and then they're off and running on their own? Because it sounds like things could switch every year. And, and, and I know it has, yeah. Yeah, so, so essentially the way I structured my agreements is let's just say there's a couple of kids in the family. Well, my agreement will last until the youngest child is graduate, you know, is a graduate from college, from undergrad. 
And so, yeah, so I stick with you every year. I give you the answer keys so you can fill out the FAFSA and CSS profile in my in my way. And then, of course, initially, we're probably almost everybody is restructuring something um, to reduce their college costs. And, and what I do is I come up with a plan, and maybe the plan will have five different things for you to do. And some parents will say, "Okay, I'll do all five. And other parents are like, you know, I'll do three of the five, but the last two um, I, I won't do. And I understand that if I don't do those two, my college costs will be up here instead of down here. But I would rather not do those things and pay a little bit more for college. And that's fine. So, you know, we come up with a plan. You implement the parts of the plan you want. And then if you don't want to implement certain parts, great. And, and then, you know, and then we work until your kids are out of uh, college. Yeah. Awesome. I hope I qualify for your complimentary uh, meeting because well, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so actually, um, I think we're good with the questions. The last one was actually a a, 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 a repeat, and mm -hmm. and so I think Natasha maybe come on. Um, is I think we can have a recording of this um, available for people. Oh, wonderful! As, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no problem at all. Yeah, so if we want to give out, if people want to watch this or send it off to their friends, not a problem at all. Or you can just direct them to www.collegecashsolutions.com, and I have a video of this presentation on my website. And then right. more importantly, there's also a book a meeting. You can book a meeting, and we can have a Zoom conference. Damn. And I can calculate very quickly if I can help you reduce your college costs or not. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Excellent. Great. Well. Looks like that's all the time we have for today, but we're so grateful that you were able to join us. And thanks again to Gary and Mimi and to everyone who attended and participated in our discussion. We would love to stay connected with you. So if you have not done so already, please subscribe to our Better Letter and follow us on our social media accounts. I will send out a recording of this event tomorrow, along with resources you need to stay connected with us and with Gary. And if you're watching this as a recording on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. We upload new content regularly. Uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us, and I wish you all a wonderful rest of your week. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.